And welcome back, welcome back. All right, so we are ready to speak with my good friend and, of course, uh, uh, attorney at law, Martin George. Good morning, sir. Hi, good morning to you, Brother B, and good morning to Bagel, and good morning to your listeners in the wider diaspora. I know people listen to you all over the world, from Sweden, Finland, <laughs> Canada, London, Germany, everywhere. They tune into Tobago Channel 5. Very good. And when we call on you twice per week, it means, therefore, that you too are in demand and uh, is being listened to all over the world, yes? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Let's, All right. let's hope our friends in Switzerland are listening. Yes, they are. And of course, uh, Grover, Grover is here, just to let you know okay. that. All right. Let's get into it. Mr. George, obviously, um, yesterday, well, not yesterday, on Wednesday, we saw Unprecedented. Obviously, uh, we had that conversation leading up to what transpired on Wednesday, where we had the swearing in of, uh, and I say the swearing in because that's where I want to go, um, the uh, presiding officer. Uh, did allow for the swearing in to take place of the new chief secretary, who is Mr. Ansel Dennis. Now, uh, yesterday we spoke with Quasi Dennis and Quasi Devines, and he said that the president will either arrange to come to Tobago or, or, or the, um, uh, uh, Mr. Dennis goes to Trinidad, whichever. In fact, he has to she has to come to Tobago to do the official training. Is that illegal that took place at the uh, legislature on Wednesday, that swearing in? Well, and I think this is where we need to ensure that as a new iteration of the Tobago House of Assembly, that there is some kind of credibility going forward. If it is that a mistake was made, then you must be man enough to step forth and admit that to the public of Tobago. The public is not foolish. So to simply seek to gloss it over and simply say, well, the president is coming to the, the official swearing in. No, you need to first level up to the public of Tobago, admit that, look, for whatever reason, because we're all human, erare humanus est, since the days of Plato, this has been indicated, to, uh, is human. So therefore, admit that um, an error was made. Let the public understand that you are, you know, giving your mere culpa and say, look, we were wrong to think that the presiding officer had the power to administer the oath of office for the chief secretary because subsequent to that, they, they, they had a press conference and to all the world, it appeared as if they were holding this out as the final act for the installation of a chief secretary. And that is absolutely wrong. Wow. So therefore... Okay, okay, that, okay. Look. One minute. Stay right there. Now, I'm going to ask, you know, and you're a man of the law and you should know, well, you would be able to guide us accordingly. Now, uh, is it that she did not know that's the presiding officer, Ms. Thomas, uh, or is it that she felt that it was the right thing to do? And uh, we... Uh, the way you feel or, uh, uh, or, or protocol has been breached? Or, or is it that she, 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 or is she was in the right? Um, I, I want to get as to what led to the thinking that she is in the right to do what she did. Um, and of course, you are saying that is wrong. It's a breach of protocol. How do we fix no, that? No, no, sorry. I, I'm not, I, I didn't say protocol. It's actually a breach of the law. Oh, okay. All right. Not protocol. Not protocol. This is not a protocol issue. Okay. You need to understand this. This is a legal issue. Good. However, right. it's not necessarily as dramatic as some folks may wish to make it seem because it's something that can be corrected, mm. if you understand me. But what I'm saying is that for credibility, the persons at the assembly, I don't know who is in charge at this stage, but they must step forth and level with the Tobago public and say, look, we understand we made a mistake. Now, in terms of what was exercising the mind of the presiding officer, I, I must confess I have no crystal ball to divine or interpret what was in her mind. The only thing I can look to is that maybe with the provisions of Section 21.6 
of the Tobago House of Assembly Act. She may have possibly looked at that. And of course, I say this with the greatest of reservation because I don't know what guided her. But mm. when I look at the act, the only thing I can see that could possibly have led someone to think that you may have had that power would be Section 21.6. Mm -hmm. But I'll show you why that is wrong in law, categorically wrong in law. 21.6 says, a person elected or appointed to the assembly to fill a vacancy shall be administered the relevant oath of officer, office by the presiding officer. Mm -hmm. So when one looks at that superficially, it may seem to suggest, well, the presiding officer could administer the oath. Mm. But that's not so, because law is something you always take it in context. Mm. So let's look at the context of Section 21.6. 21.6 follows from 19.20 and 21. Those three sections are to be read in conjunction. When you look at what 19 starts off with, right? Section 19 says, <clears throat> subject to Section 20, the seat of an assemblyman becomes vacant when he, and it sets out the categories which could make the seat of an assemblyman vacant. Then 19.2 speaks about the revocation of appointment of a councillor. So let's look at the categories you're speaking about. You're speaking about an assemblyman, you're speaking about a councillor, and then under 21, uh, under 19.2b, it speaks about the presiding officer. So there are three <clears throat> specific categories that are being spoken of here. Assemblyman, councillor, and presiding officer. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's those offices that the presiding officer would have the authority to swear in. Okay. And they even go so far, just now, let me just finish. They even go so far in 21.6 to see if it's the office of the presiding officer that's being sworn in, the deputy presiding officer is the one to administer that oath. Mm -hmm. So when, when you look at what constitutes the assembly, and that's important because, you see, when you go to 21, right, 21 says where the president is notified that the seat of an assemblyman has become vacant, mm -hmm. right, and then it talks about what, they, what is to be done in those circumstances, mm -hmm. right, and then it says at 21.4 where the seat of the presiding officer becomes vacant, and then 21.5 talks about where the appointment of a councillor. So in other words, it's still those three offices. Mm -hmm. Assemblyman, presiding officer, councillor. All right? And then now you understand the context of 21.6, which says a person elected or appointed to the assembly. And here's where you tie it all in. And this is the beauty of law. When you look at Section 5 of the Act to see what's the definition of the assembly, there you have your answer as clear as day. In Section 5, it indicates what constitutes the assembly, right? And I'll read the section for you. It says, <clears throat> the assembly shall be a body corporate and consist of 12 assemblymen, for councillors, a presiding officer. So you see, it's back to those same three offices. Mm -hmm. Assemblyman, councillor, mm -hmm. presiding officer. Okay. So therefore, the power of the presiding officer to administer the oath is only limited to when someone assumes office in one of those positions. It has nothing to do with someone assuming the office mm -hmm. of chief secretary or deputy chief secretary. Excellent. That is reserved to the president only. Okay. All right. And, and that is clear. And so, uh, and you said it, uh, it's nothing to be over dramatic about. It's an error, uh, uh, a breach in law as, as far as administering or who is responsible for administering that uh, positioning of uh, uh, installing a chief secretary. Now, okay, so the, the president will make her way to Tobago as to administer that officially. So presently, he but is not. No, no. The, the thing is, you see, um, I, I would also be careful of using the term officially 
it's the only way it's administered. You see, I, I don't want I don't want um, the persons at the assembly to engage in you know semantics or sophistry in this regard to say, well, this was the first oath and now we have in the official oath. No. Admit to the people of Tobago a mistake was made. These things happen, and it's being rectified. But, but, so, in other words, the oath of office is to be administered by the president, and that's clear from Section Eight of the Act, because it says in in Section Eight, the president shall administer to the chief secretary and the deputy chief secretary, respectively, the oath of office as set out in the third schedule. Mm -hmm. So, that third schedule oath which the presiding officer purported to administer. Mm. That's why I'm saying that was illegal. Mm. She does not have the authority. Mm. That authority is reserved only to the mm. president. All right. Watson Duke would have, I don't know if he was guided by that knowledge that you just spoke to, but he would have challenged the uh, presiding officer in asking for uh, an explanation or clarity as to the legality of what was taking place on Wednesday. I want you to speak to that as to what grounds, of course, Watson, based on what you're saying, then Watson was in the right. Um, just give us more uh, clarity as to Watson's let, position. Let, 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 let's, let's be very careful. Let's be very careful. Uh, all First right. of all, yeah. <laughs> the, from what I saw of the correspondence that was sent by Mr. Duke, mm. it had nothing to do with this. Okay. His concerns were on an entirely different basis. Mm. From what I recall, he raised concerns as to, he asked as to what legal advice the presiding officer had yeah. in relation to the entire proceeding. Yes, yes. Place on Wednesday. Uh -huh. He also asked in terms of what provision of the act provides for the swearing in or the election of a chief secretary mm -hmm. who has voluntarily resigned um, or demitted office. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, he was pointing to the narrow issue, which I think you and I addressed and canvassed mm -hmm. in our last conversation yes, yes, yes. a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. where we spoke to the deficiencies in the legislation, mm -hmm. whereby it deals with circumstances where a chief secretary can be forced to resign if a vote of no confidence has been passed mm -hmm. or it has some other um, scenarios, but it never addresses frontally mm -hmm. the issue of a voluntary resignation. Mm -hmm. So I think Mr. Duke then premised his um, challenge, um, which was put out in his letter, on those bases to say, well, look, the legislation doesn't speak specifically. But remember how I addressed that. I indicated to you that even though the legislation doesn't speak specifically to it. One is entitled to adopt a purposive interpretation. In other words, you could never legislate for every single thing on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And the courts understand and accept that. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the legislation tries to cover or mm -hmm. anticipate as many scenarios as possible. But ultimately, given the vagaries of human nature, there will be things that you may not anticipate and you would not have set out specifically in the legislature. Mm -hmm. All right. Mr. George, the stay. law allows you mm -hmm. to have a purposive interpretation. All right. We'll go for a break for news. And we, when we come back, we continue this very, very interesting and incisive, and incisive uh, uh, conversation about uh, the selecting of or installing of a new chief secretary. All right. We'll see you after Thank the break. You, All right. Welcome back. And for those of you on Pulse 89.5 FM, we are indeed thankful that you chose us. You could have been anywhere. All right, we are having our conversation with Mr. Martin George, attorney at law, uh, um, a very, very well knowledgeable attorney at law, one must say that. And we are speaking to the process of, the, of electing a chief secretary. And of course, he outlined uh, what the procedure should be and uh, the swearing in is only for the president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to do uh, all right. so so we got that clear and um, well <laughs> and you asked for uh, the or should we say maybe the leader to come forward and to apologize maybe uh, to the public for that error or whose responsibility it is uh, to, to, to make that um, to bring that to the public 
Well, the thing is, at this present time, what you would have is a, <clears throat> a person who has been selected as the putative chief secretary, mm -hmm. or sometimes you could refer to that person as the chief secretary elect. Right. So in other words, this is the person who has been chosen mm -hmm. as the person they want to be installed in office as the chief secretary. And then you also have the deputy chief secretary, whom I think may be the best person legally and, you know, from a legislative standpoint to step forth and say something in the circumstances. Because when one looks at the definition section of the THA Act, it says the chief secretary shall also include, where necessary, the deputy chief secretary. So in other words, it is possible that in the absence of an, of an appointed chief secretary, that the deputy chief secretary can be the one who can step forth and say something. Mm. Now, it's not his error, if you understand me, and it's not that um, he has to apologize um, for something he did wrong, but I think an explanation, and, and this is what I keep saying, you know, if politicians would treat with the population as if they are thinking, rational beings who are capable of research, who are capable of knowledge and understanding, then you approach the population in a mature manner and say, listen, people, a mistake was made, and we recognize that, and it is regretted. However, we are taking steps to correct it, and in moving forward, we would like to ensure that things are done properly. You wouldn't believe how much goodwill you can gain from such a gesture. Mm. But when you try to adopt a high-handed approach where you are not admitting a mistake, but you're simply saying, well, okay, the president is coming for the official swearing-in. So then what are you saying? That that was an unofficial swearing-in? You know, it, it, it raises all these uncomfortable scenarios which can be avoided by simply coming forth and leveling with the public because at the end of the day, the people will respect you more if you step forth and say, look, um, it's a mere culpa. We made an error. Let's correct it and move forward. And in that regard, that's why I say, um, and I say this with the greatest of respect and deference to those who maybe sharpen their legal axes, <laughs> preparing maybe to go to court um, over this. I am not sure it's something that necessarily um, needs to engage the time or attention of the High Court, either by way of judicial review or by way of constitutional motion, in any substantive way. And wh when I say substantive, and I, I just want to make this clear, the point is you may get a declaration which may end up being a pyrrhic victory in the sense that you may eventually get a declaration to say, well, yes, that was wrong. But at the end of the day, if it can be easily corrected and if it's going to be admitted, yes, it was wrong and we're correcting it, then what's the point really of going and exciting the court, particularly at this time? Mm -hmm. Of course, this is just um, the, the, the way I see it based upon the legislation. Persons may have other reasons for wanting to approach the, the, the steps of the, of the high court. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, I, I cannot comment on that. But, you know, in terms of those who are panicked to think that, well, you know, by admitting we did something wrong, it opens the door for a slew of litigation. Mm -hmm. The only way that can be possible is if in pursuance of this purported installation to office, if it is that the executive council of the THA then purported to do things between Wednesday afternoon and whenever the president does the swearing in, then, then they can run into trouble. Because if one looks at Section 33 of the THA Act, where it sets out specifically who comprises the executive council, Section 33 makes it clear that the executive council comprises the chief secretary, the deputy chief secretary, and then it goes on from there to say such other secretaries not being more than seven, mm -hmm. right? right? So in other words, you cannot have an executive council yeah. of the THE okay. when there's no chief secretary. Right. So just let me clear this up, um, mm -hmm. Brother B. It's important for Tobago to understand this. Mm -hmm. So 
from the time at which Mr. Kelvin Charles effected his resignation from the office of chief secretary up until the president administers the oath, I want to begonians to understand there has been no executive council in the THA existing in law. So therefore, we need to be very careful to examine to see whether there have been any decisions taken, any acts done, which purport to be actions of the executive council during that interregnum. Mm -hmm. Because if so, those can easily be challenged in the court of law. So that's why I'm, I'm just giving this, this closure, mm -hmm. right? So it's not that I'm saying that the things cannot be challenged, but I'm saying that the swearing in aspect was a mistake. It needs to be admitted. It needs they need to be candid and forthright and admit it was a mistake. That can be corrected. Mm -hmm. If, however, they purported to act as an executive council in the interregnum between the effecting of Mr. Charles's resignation and the uh, the swearing in by the president of a new chief secretary, then those decisions that they purported to do as an executive council, mm -hmm. those are definitely open to okay. challenge. We got that, that very clear, very thing. clear. No, and you, you, well, I don't want to say you jumped the gun. I was getting to the point that Watson wanted to challenge what transpired on Tuesday, on Wednesday in the court, and you advised against it. So I wouldn't go over that. However, no, no, no. I, have not, I have not advised against it. No, by no, all means, no, 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 no. You, but you do as he pleases. Yeah, I but, have not purporting to offer advice to Mr. No, but what I mean is... I'm just simply looking at the law yeah. and suggesting what I see as the reasonable yeah. actions that okay. one could or should take. And trust me, I am not at all trying to offer this as legal advice to anyone. Okay, fine. All right. So, and, and okay. So let's go to the question of the executive council. And you outlined clearly no decision they can convene until they are... Uh, the installing of the new chief secretary by the That's president. Right. Also, the executive council uh, may need some reshuffling. If they do decide to do that, that's when uh, you, you, uh, they too are installed by the uh, president. Uh, I bring some clarity to that as to uh, the, should there be a new uh, executive council? Could be the same persons. However, under this new chief secretary, uh, this council will now exist. Uh, bring that clear. All right, okay. And this is the part where I think most Tobagonians are not aware, all right? And I'm, I'm, I'm making mention of it for the first time here on your program this morning. I will address it later on today in extenso. But the interesting thing is that most people don't seem to realize upon the president administering that oath of office, automatically a chief secretary is appointed and as a direct result thereof by virtue of section 36 of the THA Act, all secretarial positions become vacant immediately. Wow. So in other words, all secretaries who are currently, you know, I mean, I, I guess walking about, you know, um, loud and proud, thinking, well, yes, I'm a secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly. Upon the appointment and installation into office of a new chief secretary, mm -hmm. your offices are Fine. automatically deemed to be vacant. And mm -hmm. it's clear when one looks at Section 36 of the Act. So in other words, your secretary for tourism, your secretary for sports and all those offices automatically become vacant. So I'm not sure that people recognize that. So mm -hmm. th this is a very calamitous change that is taking place here. Mm -hmm. And it's very momentous because it means that now Mr. Ansel Dennis, who is the chief secretary elect, mm -hmm. upon his being sworn in by the president, he now has the authority to determine who shall be the secretaries for the THA wow. for the rest of this term. Mm. He has the authority because the law allows him to do so in consultation mm. with the other members of the assembly. Mm. 
But at the end of the day, as I um, indicated to you on the last occasion, consultation in law simply means, okay, I've discussed it with you. I hear your views. I don't agree with you. I'm going to do my own thing. That's what consultation in law means. It means that I have given you the opportunity to air your views. Mm. It doesn't mean I have to accept your views at all. So in other words, when, when, I, when the law says I must consult with you or I must do so in consultation with you, mm. I simply allow you the opportunity to have your say, mm. and I could very well ignore everything you say and go ahead and do as I plan to do. Um, initially, and that's legal, okay. because basically the chief secretary is the one who gives the nominations to the president of the names right. of the seven persons good. to be appointed as secretary. Very good. All right. Because that was my next question. So he's supposed to, uh, at this present time, uh, preparing a list of names of uh, the prospective candidates or um, secretaries to the varying divisions. And when that is done, on that said day of swearing in, each of these secretaries will take their oath of office as well. well. I, I, I don't know how it's been planned, if you understand me. Okay. Right? So in other words, I don't know if it is that he has done so proactively or presumptively, or if it is that he's going to wait until he is of, he's installed in office and then you know, seek to um, do that on a separate occasion. I, I don't know. As, as I say, I, I try to stay very far from politics and politicians. <laughs> well, well, you were right in it as much as you were trying to stay from it because we value <laughs> this kind of information, Mr. George, and um, I think, uh, you know, uh, and we really appreciate it. But let me, let me just get into this juicy part of this situation, unprecedented. Here it is, and I want to get from you, and I was reading earlier from uh, Dr. Winsford James, uh, recognizing that this is just an interim Chief Secretary, obviously, he's there to make his way or make way for uh, the uh, the leader of the Tobago PNM Council. Now, why 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 is he described as an interim Chief Secretary? That's that's what Mr. Vanus, Mr. Winford James uh, referred to that positioning. Oh, okay, uh, okay, very good. Okay, so okay. I I want to get from you now a perspective and looking at Tobago, and I said earlier in uh, my opening treating with this, uh, that they are playing musical chairs with the office of the chief secretary. Obviously, there are serious matters that needs to be treated with, internal self-government and a number of other issues. Um, give me an overall view as to the direction that Tobago should go, uh, given the, 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 the needs that we have here on this piece of uh, real estate. Well, the thing is, you know that I have always been very consistent in my um, perspective on this, in that the first thing that Tobago must aim for, and of course, it's a long-term um, objective. It's not something that would be achieved in the short term, but we must start planning a roadmap for this, is financial self-sustainability. And I've said this repeatedly. So all the talk about self-governance and wanting to be a man in your own house and to chart your own course and you want your freedom, etc., it all comes down to finances and economics. If you don't have that financial or economic freedom, you can bark as much as you want and it does nothing. It's like a, a dog chasing a car. He's running, barking after the car, chasing it. When he catches the car, what does he do with it? <laughs> Nothing. Yes. So, so it, it's a useless right. pursuit. Okay. But the thing is, he feels good barking and chasing, and the other dogs, they join in the chase, and everybody's caught up in the chase. Not one single person is thinking, when we catch the car, what are we going to do? So the same way, and using that example, it's an excellent example that we can use. If you keep running down this notion of self-governance and running your own affairs, mm -hmm and you don't first take care of your financial self-sustainability or your economic independence, if tomorrow the government of Trinidad and Tobago were to cut Tobago loose and say, OK, Tobago, you've been clamoring for independence. We cut the navel string. We cut the economic feed line. OK, we cut the IV line of the money that keeps flowing to Tobago to support you every year. All right, you're on your own. What are the leaders in Tobago going to do? You, you ask any one of them that. What is their plan if they don't have that $3 billion that comes every year from central government? So in other words, 
while we have this gravy train, and that's what it has really been for Tobago, while you have this gravy train, you need to now put systems in place whereby you build a foundation for your economic future self-sustainability. So in other words, you don't just go spending all the money on recurrent expenditure, saying it's on wages and salaries and paying bills and paying for tent rental and paying for plants and paying for functions and, you know, social activities where you, you invite the public of Tobago and you feed them and you, you offer them drinks and everybody slaps their, each other on the back and says, yes, boy, the THA is working. That's not, that's not what governance in any meaningful way is about. Mm -hmm. We need to look beyond the superficial and look beyond these trappings of office mm -hmm. and see how we can now plan a foundation for a Tobago that can eventually reach to such a point of financial maturity mm -hmm. and economic self-sustainability mm -hmm. that there's no question that is going to be asked in terms of your own independence because okay. at the end of the day, you will be in a position where you say, look, I don't need Trinidad anymore, so therefore um, I don't have to ask for independence. I don't have to ask for self-government. I can run my own affairs. Great. And you know, a good just, just let me finish this. A good example is like you know, a child growing up in their parents' house. Mm -hmm. While you're young, you depend on your parents for food, shelter, clothing, etc., little money to go out and lime and stuff like that. You cannot, at five years old, say to your parents, "Well." I want to be a man I going out on my own because you don't have the means of economic or financial self-sustenance, right? So the point is, even at 17 or 18, if you're not working yet and you don't have the money, you can't do it as much as you may want to. But as you grow older, you have a job, you build up savings and stuff like that. Then it's no longer a question of you having to ask your parents' permission, well, mommy or daddy, could I leave the house? No, you have your own means, you have your own job, you have your own earnings, you have your own income, you have your own savings. So therefore, it's a question of you deciding, well, look, okay, do I want to stay here or do I want to move out? So it's, it becomes your decision. You don't then have to go and ask anybody for permission. You don't have to go and say, well, mommy, I need money for rent. If you could rent a place or daddy, I need money to buy a car. No, you say, hey, folks, thanks. It was nice, but listen, I need my own space. I have my own money. I'm moving on. Mm -hmm. That's what financial and economic independence is about. And once you have that, then there's never any question of you having to ask anybody for internal self-government or independence or freedom or anything so because you have it already. All right. I want to, I'm giving you a portfolio now, uh, Mr. Martin George, as advisor to the new elected uh, or uh, chief secretary elect, and you are now advisor. Our first priority as we close this morning's conversation what would be your advice to the present chief secretary? Well, the thing is, I mean, first of all, I would say that um, I am definitely heartened by the fact that, look, you have someone who is young, and by that I am assuming that means he's open to new ideas, new thinking, and new ways of doing things. Because we can't continue doing things the way we've been going previously, right? Um, that, that's the recipe for madness. If you keep doing the same wrong thing all the time and hoping that it will suddenly get right. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that that's the first thing. So that's a plus in his favor. What I would suggest to him, and I do so with the greatest of ref, um, deference and respect, is that he must now chart his own course, his own way, in that he even though it's a short period of time, he must leave his mark in terms of showing that, look, he does have a vision for the future. So therefore, you, you, you will not have persons saying, well, look, okay, because you are young, therefore you, you're not um, suitable for the office. No, he must show that maturity, that vision. He must also have an all-embracing approach. And that is so important in Tobago because too often we have seen circumstances of the backbiting and the infighting and the partisanship and, you know, whereby persons who are qualified, who are capable, who are gifted and talented, but because they're not wearing your political party's jersey, you keep, you know, denying them any opportunity to make a contribution. You keep fighting them down. And th th if, if he can show that all-embracing, all-encompassing approach, whereby he invites all Tobagonians to be on board and he genuinely acts on it, 
not just lip service, you know? So therefore, in other words, regardless of what your political persuasion is, if you are able to make a meaningful contribution to Tobago, I invite you to come on board and I'm genuine about it. I will allow you to make your contribution. If it is that there's a post to be filled, you don't choose it on party affiliation, political party affiliation. You choose it on competence and capability and the ability to deliver. Then I think in this short space of time, that is between now and when the elections are constitutionally due, I think Mr. Dennis can make a tremendous mark if he changes that tone and that mindset that has bedeviled the THA for decades. <laughs> because that has really been, you know, the, the, the center of the destruction of any productive effort in Tobago. Because you hear so many people who say, well, look, you know, they have been working in this place, but because of political affiliation, they lost their jobs or, you know, that nonsense has to stop. We are too small, we are too few to be having that kind of fighting. Of course, when elections are in the air, of course, on the political hustings, yes, you will have your back and forth, fine. Once the elections are over, we must learn to now embrace all Tobagonians who are willing to constructively contribute to the development of the island. Excellent advice, and I see you now as advisor to the chief secretary for these next seven months. Yes, you accept, <laughs> Swain? I swear you into office. He's trying to give me portfolios. <laughs> 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 Mr. Martin Church, brilliant, brilliant advice. And of course, I would hope that, uh, you know, it falls on fertile ears, as I would like to say. And of course, we want to thank Well, the you. Bible speaks of that, eh? you it, know, it says that the man who sows his yeah. grain on, you know, fertile soil. But yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, um, the Bible also speaks about casting pearls. So. Against I guess we'll see <laughs> All right. which way it goes. Excellent, excellent. And we want to thank you very, very much for your intervention this morning and, of course, your insight. And we really, really appreciate all that we have it's learned from you. It's always a pleasure. Years. And as I always say, I love us having these types of discussions yeah. so that we can inspire, educate, inform, and stimulate creative discussion amongst Tobagonians. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And have a wonderful weekend, my brother. Take care. Thank you. Same to you. All right. All right. Very good. Martin Georgian, good advice. And it's time we put aside and see the best people and not what jersey they're wearing after election is gone. And as he said, we are too small and too few. Uh, very, very significant points there. And of course, all the information that we got. So, um, and, and, you know, and, and when we saw the swearing in, and we spoke about that yesterday inside Cup of Tea uh, by uh, uh, the, the presiding officer leading that. And Watson did ask uh, about, you know, whether this is legal or not. In fact, he wanted clarity and did not get an answer, as he said yesterday, when we have him here on Rise and Shine. And clearly, well, uh, based on, uh, we heard from Kristen Moore yesterday saying you're going to take him to court or take this matter to court to do what? And basically, you got the same response from Martin George as well. But anyway, at the end of the day, we look forward to seeing the president uh, coming to do uh, the real, of well, I, I was going to say the official swearing in of the chief secretary and, of course, the executive council which would comprise our secretaries. And so we learned, and of course, uh, for those of you who did not know, uh, the new chief secretary has the responsibility, and of course, he would sit down with his team as to decide who secretaries or, or who are the secretaries in the varying positions. And that has to happen for uh, him to lead his charges, as it were, after they, was, they are sworn in as well. All right, so very interesting. And of course, we watch to see, and uh, we hope Tobago would be better off in the next seven months. All right, let's go for a break. When we come back, we'll take your calls for the rest of this morning's program. See you then.